Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. I am Mark Fernandez, and today I am joined by the legendary Nicholas Meyer, director, uh, icon, whatever you want to call him, he's uh, uh, is that. And um, I want to get into a bunch of your uh, stuff around your career, um, your new memoirs, and uh, just kind of get to know you a little bit, Nicholas. So first of all, how are you today? I'm fine so far. I'm like the guy who's jumped off the Empire State Building and <laughs> goes, how are you? He goes, as he's passing the 54th floor, is it so far so good? <laughs> so far so good. Yeah, it's funny because I've been, uh, lately I've kind of in my middle age crisis, I've been learning how to fly an airplane. And I've been doing uh, these weekly courses, you know, where, where I get in a, like a tiny little el- you know airplane, literally from the 50s, like all these little training aircraft are literally from the 50s and um everything is good but then like you know you start to realize oh my god is this thing gonna land but um so you know anyway i um i want to sort of land all right the question is will you land with it (laughs) yes yes very good point so so nicholas how did you get started in this whole career like if we go all the way back to the beginning how did you sort of first get that trajectory in your life to start going into the career of filmmaking? Well, um, I grew up in New York City uh, after the war. The war ended in August of 45, and I was born in Christmas Eve of that year. Mm. So I grew up in a sort of fairy tale New York. It was sort of Disneyland, except it wasn't made out of plastic. It was all real. And there was back then something called a middle class. My dad was a doctor. And then a middle class doctor could afford to live in New York, mm. and send his kid to a nice school and, and go to the ballet, go to the opera, go to musicals, go to museums, go to the movies. And so all these things were sort of thrown at me and I gobbled them all up. Interestingly, we did not have a television in 1950. Mm. Um, So I'd never seen a film until I was taken to a movie theater around the corner and saw a movie and um, I ran out of the movie terrified and screaming. I was so frightened. was seeing um (coughs) then of course i had uh what is known as a counterphobic reaction counterphobia is where the object feared becomes the object loved Mm. i suppose it's a version of stockholm syndrome i Mm. fell in love with movies i fell in love with that movie i fell in love with that actor i had a man crush on Laurence olivier for the rest of my life. (laughs) Um, And then when my dad introduced me to the books of Jules Verne and the novels of Arthur Conan Doyle, I fell in love with all that. And I was always writing, I don't know why, making up my own stories. And at first my dad would write them down for me and then he said, you know, hey, I'm tired of this, you write your own stories. So I had to learn how to read. Um, and then I was writing stuff and I was sort of imitating the stories or the movies that I read that I had been so taken with, so impressed by. That's the sort of short version. People say, when did you decide to become a writer? I said, I never decided any such thing. I'm still thinking about it. Right. You were talking about um, this uh, counterphobia concept, which is actually very interesting, which is something I can relate to. And uh, your early days, you were watching uh, the Sir Lawrence Olivier film. And which film was it? The Beggar's Opera. Oh, I don't think I've ever seen that one. Well, it it probably three people were the only ones who ever saw it. The, Be- <laughs> the Beggar's Opera <clears throat> was the first musical. It was written in, I think, 1728 by a man named John Gay. And it was produced 
by a man named Richard Rich, and it was known as the opera that made rich gay and gay rich. <laughs> um, and it's the father, <clears throat> it's the progenitor of Bertolt Brecht's The Three Penny Opera. Oh, wow. Um, so Mac the Knife was originally Captain McKeith, and Laurence Olivier played Captain McKeith. The movie was directed by a 23-year-old Peter Brook, who just oh. at a very, very ripe old age and is one of the most important stage directors of the last hundred years. Mm. Um, and when he was 23, he decided to make a movie of the Beggar's Opera. It had Olivier, it had Stanley Holloway, it had Hugh Griffiths, and it had uh, a lovely young actress named Dorothy Tewton. She was a stage, primarily a stage actress. Um, and I was fixated by the film and that when they were going to hang Captain McKeith, the highwayman, I ran out of the theater very frightened. And uh, how old were you, roughly? Well, I was about seven. Okay, yeah, so very young. Yeah, extremely young. Wow. So, you know, this is a little bit of a tangent, but how do you think back in those days, a 23 year old is able to sort of put together that big a show? How old was Orson Welles in 1941 when he did Citizen Kane? He was 21, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yeah. 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 Look, some, somehow some people, uh, age is irrelevant, right? Age is well, irrelevant. I have, listen, you know, Mozart was already a supreme genius by the time he was 12. Right. Uh, so, uh, and I think art certainly begins as a young man's game. And I think that film directing is certainly a young man's game. Uh, there are filmmakers like Bunuel um, and John Huston who just keep going and, uh, or, and they get better and better. Yeah, Martin Scorsese. Yeah, they just keep going, but they start young. Sure. Um, and I think when movies start getting made by very young people, there's a heavy dose of ingenuity, improvisation, and financing by dentists um, right, or right. friends of the families and so forth. And and it's it's all cut and paste anyway, which is what all art tends to be, is, is a history of cut and paste. Yeah, that's a very interesting way to look at it as well. Um, so this 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 puts you on a trajectory um, to start taking this craft, whether it's screenwriting, uh, you know, play playwriting, acting, or directing as a sort of course of life. And how did that start to manifest itself? Well, I wasn't a very good student. Um, I could only sort of absorb things that interested me. And the only thing that really interested me were stories. Um, I could totally relate to anything that started with Once Upon a Time. And I was there. But the rest of the time I would sit in class. And I'm sure it wasn't the fault of the teachers. Um, and sort of not understand what was being said. In those days, nobody knew anything about ADHD or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and my symptoms, if that's what you could call them, were distinctly uh, mild. I, I was not dyslexic. I was not hyperactive or any of those things. Um, and as I say, if it was something that interested me, I would stay fixated. It's like watching, you know, porn. If they're if they're if they're doing the thing that you're interested in, you can just stay there and watch for a long time. But when they go off onto something that isn't your bag, you start wondering how much money you have left on the parking meter and right, you're, right. It wanders away. And so in class, if they were talking about history or if they were talking about literature, um I was able to focus and pay attention. Mm. Uh, but if they were, you know, talking about numbers or if they were talking about chemicals, 
um, no, I was, you know, if they were talking about athletics, I was good at that. Um, but otherwise, no, I just was a, a dummy. Yeah, that's a very interesting way to look at it. You know, what, what what some people call ADHD could just simply be, you know, interest, aptitude, right? Like, and uh, school has always had that issue of not being able to tailor for specific aptitude. It's always this kind of very general study up until you hit 16, 17, pretty much. Um, and it's, you know, like with the advent of magnet schools in the eighties, you know, that, that kind of became a little bit, you know, better, you know, like I myself went to a magnet school where you could have more of a focus on the, on the plastic arts for me in particular, but you know, that, that kind of, you know, charter school mentality of focusing on specific disciplines is, is something that's very new. And even till today, it's still very experimental. Where were you at school? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Miami and I went to a, a school called uh, first I went to one called South Miami and then I went to one called New World School of the Arts, which was the one of the first high schools, um, I think, in the country that actually had like a focused magnet school, um, like, you know, like approach, you know, to a study. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically you would have <clears throat> like half of your day was your magnet focus and then the other half was like the normal uh, school stuff. Well, there was a high school in New York, which I did not attend, but almost everybody else I knew did, called the High School of Music and Art, um, which sounds not dissimilar to what you're describing. Right. And then and then I think there was even like a TV show based off of it called Fame or something you like bet. that. You bet. Yeah, yeah. Alan but, Park. Yeah. And that whole thing is not really, like, it's not pushed as much, right? It's still a, It's still a rarity. Um, when you, you know, to identify talent or aptitude and, and there's other schools popped up actually in Florida, there seems to be a lot of them. There's one that's focused on like marine biology and there's one that's focused on engineering, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's very interesting uh, when you're able to sort of, or would it be interesting if you were able to kind of focus that uh, focus learning on aptitude at a much younger age, like you're describing. But in any case, I I'm sorry, continue. Isn't there a governor in Florida now who tells you what books you're allowed to read and what books you're not? So uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't know all the details in it, but I do know that there has been some sense of hyperbole about what this governor does or doesn't do. Uh, because obviously he's a threat to the other side and, and all this stuff. I don't really get it too involved in that stuff, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I, don't, I don't know about sides. I just think it's funny when people start saying, oh, you can't read this book. I mean, I directed a television movie about nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union in 1983. And it has the distinction of being, I didn't write it, I just directed it, of being the most watched movie ever made for television. 100, oh. million, 100 million people watched my movie in one night. And it's the movie... It's called that, The Day After? Yes. Okay, okay, yes. I'm sorry, continue. Did you, did you read the memoir that I wrote? I have not read it yet. I have not read it yet, in full disclosure. But, but I am familiar with The Day After. The day after changed President Reagan's mind about a winnable nuclear war and sent wow. him off to Reykjavik to meet with uh, Soviet Premier Gorbachev, who died today, um, to sign the Intermediate Range Missile Treaty. Um, the point I'm getting at is that the day after got a hundred million people to watch, which is the most people ever to watch a made for movie uh, thing on television, made for television movie, I should say. Um, and it, it got that huge audience because everybody said, you're not supposed to watch this movie. The, right. the, the, uh, the conservative, and they all seem pretty mild by today's standards, the conservative right went after this movie as being pro-Russian and somehow the fact that it was, the, the movie simply depicted a war 
between the United States and the Soviet Union, depicted the missiles going off, depicted the bombs falling. It wasn't about politics. It wasn't about the military. It was about people like us who get nuked. Right. And everybody <laughs> dies. And it just simply said, if, if you have a nuclear war, this is what it's going to be like on a good day. And it didn't, it didn't take sides. It didn't say who started it. It wasn't interested in any of that. It's just, well, what is a nuclear war like? Yeah, a but little thought experiment. But everybody ran up and down the country like Chicken Little saying that if you watch this movie, you know, the United States will come to an end, whatever, um, and don't watch it. And right. in the publishing business, we say there's nothing like being banned in Boston to make sure that your book sells. Yeah, yeah. And I think for a lot of people, the moment you say you can't do this or you can't do that or you mustn't read this and you mustn't watch that, then people says, you know, says who and why can't I? Yeah. Um, and and then you get into things like Salman Rushdie. Um who wrote a book, which I tried to read, frankly, and couldn't get through, called The Satanic Verses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some a Arab people issue something called a fatwa. Mm -hmm. and they owe, you know, he, he must die because he wrote this book. Um, as if you could stop knowledge or progress or change or ideas by threatening people if they were to be exposed to them. The day after was a wild success because people said, don't watch this movie. Uh, yeah. we, you know, we were in effect banned in, in Boston. Um, and by the same token, I just you know, wonder about people today who when they say, you, you can't read this book, you can't teach this book, you can't, you know, and <laughs> the list of books that they got on their list is, Mark Twain would say it would be hilarious if it weren't mortal. Yeah, I um I I've heard rumblings about this as well. Um I got to look into it more because to be honest with you I have no idea, but I do I have learned that, you know, typically in our media today the number one because you know I used to own a media company not that long ago uh, that I sold, um, you know, because it was doing so well during the pandemic that I saw it as an opportunity to like move on with my life. Um, that, you know, the, the primary objective of media is typically to make people upset. Um, especially nowadays, right. It's, it's definitely evolved into what's the shortest amount of words that I can use to create, to elicit the, 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 the greatest amount of response that's going to create the highest amount of engagement. And typically, um, you know, sort of poking people, you know, where they're, you know, where they're, you know, where it hurts is the name of the game, right? So a lot of oversimplification or broad reaching happens on both sides, right? Just to get this 140 character, you know, like war of words going with each other. And, you know, um, like, for example, I think with this whole, you know, which I think goes part part and parcel with this, this kind of don't say gay bill, you know, that I'm sure you heard a lot about, uh, this happened like six or seven months ago or, you know, whenever it was, you know, earlier in the year. Sure, I know. read the papers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the reality of that bill, I think was very different than the way that it was portrayed like in the media, you know? Um, so it, so it's like with, with these things, you have to like sort of dig in to find the truth because it's become so difficult. I guess that's my real point. It's become so difficult to look through the kind of propaganda, right? It's like propaganda, like um, I think it was um, Marshall McLuhan who quoted a French philosopher, and it's like propaganda starts when dialogue ends, um, you know, where it's like you can't even have a conversation about it because even the notion of, of questioning it puts you in a bad spot, you know? Um, I think it's certainly true that when I look at the left and I look at the right, half the time, it's impossible even to agree on what is the topic. Yeah. So, <laughs> exactly. You know, one side says, well, the, the topic is a woman's right to choose. 
and or to have control over her body. And the other side says, no, the topic is murder. And once you, if, if those are the two uh, sort of positions or points of departure, we're right. in a place in the middle right. where you even meet to chat about something. And the other thing that I notice, and this is also very true of the internet, is it's a great place for incivility mm. and, and road rage. You know, one thousand percent. You know, you're hiding behind the wheel of your car, and the windows are rolled up, and you get to shout a lot of things. Sure, in the knowledge, you know, that no one can uh, harm you physically. Sure. And so the internet is an awful lot of tough talk and misinformation. I. 1000% agree. And it's like, you know, back in the day when I was younger and maybe look, maybe, the, you know, there was a veil of BS back then too, but it just seemed like there was this slightly more kind of objective approach to like reporting events, but maybe look, maybe I'm wrong. And I'm just remembering the past with rose colored glasses. And it's always been this kind of highly sort of, you know, um, motivated, approach to informing the masses with one perspective or you know like or the other but it just seemed now that like you know there's a bunch of publications that are obviously supporting one political side and there's another side that's obviously supporting the other one and they're saying completely separate things and and finding the truth is very 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 difficult nowadays it used to be that republicans and democrats could work together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there were, you know, they they would argue uh, in in the House, or they would argue in the Senate, and then they, you know, go out and have a drink together. And, yes, absolutely. And get more real stuff done. And then, starting somewhere in the Reagan era, um, it, it was considered bad form. Um, uh, you know, Newt Gingrich said, you know, don't talk to them. We don't want. Yeah, you, you know, one of my heroes, one of my political heroes, and I've gotten a chance to kind of see him. He used to work in my building. Um, in whatever he wants, we just say no. Yeah, you know, what? one thing that I, I've always respected incredibly about Bill Clinton is that Bill Clinton actually had Republicans in his cabinet, you know? And, like, the thought of that happening today would, is just like, you know, it's insanity. It would never happen today, you know? Like, you know, they would never allow... Biden or, you know, whoever Republican is in there to have a cabinet member from the other party where like Clinton, you know, after knowing that, you know, there was such a long reign of Republicans before him to have that sort of continuity and to have that different opinion was important to him. Um, so, you know, anyway, I, I, I hope that, you know, like always in, you know, like in the political landscape, th there's always pendulum swings. I, I hope think you're right. Yeah, I hope you're right. I do. You know, yeah. And, and like, you know, look, we don't even need to say his name, but like, I'm just, you know, my my one victory would be for him, for that one to just go away um, and for new blood to come in um, and to try to, you know, create a little bit of balance and a little bit of discourse, you know, and, and to try to, you know, Are bring you, us back together. Be referring to Voldemort. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, so anyway, but but getting you know getting back to your career because I'm really um, interested in how you kind of made that leap into becoming a professional screenwriter because I like if I look at your career correctly, it seems like that's when you really started to sort of get into the business was somewhere in the in the early '70s as a professional uh, screenwriter. Did you did you go to school for 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 the arts um, like in college or something like that? I went to the University of Iowa, and I was in the theater and film department. Oh, that's I, so weird. And I started out to be, well, I thought I wanted to be an actor. I guess I didn't know what that was. I was not a very good actor. You hear about them, but you seldom meet them. They're not good actors. Um, but somewhere along the line, while trying to be an actor, I discovered directing. Mm. And that looked a lot more fun. You got to sit down. Um, and writing, as I said before, was something that I just always did. I just always was a writer, didn't think much about it. Words were my 
safe place, I guess. Um, and then I came to back to New York after Iowa City. Um, and I was there for three years and I worked for Paramount Pictures in the publicity department. I wasn't sure what that was, but I got to be the unit publicist with the movie Love Story while that was being made. Oh, wow. And oh, wow. I, oh, okay. Wow. That's a whole rabbit hole. So did you know Bob Evans? Yes. Wow. That's incredible. Okay. So before we go there um, and, and, and the publicity side, um, I have to share this with you because this is like the first time that this interconnectivity has happened. When I was applying to, to colleges, um, I applied to the University of Iowa because, um, you know, not, not, not only did I love the Hawkeye logo, I thought the Hawkeye logo was awesome. Uh, but at the time, it was the only school in the country that offered a Ph.D. in, in film and cinematography. Correct. Um, and, and I thought this was like, oh, wow, if they offer a Ph.D. in film, like, you know, that's, you know, that's got to be the best place to learn. They didn't accept me. I ended up going to NYU, um, which was, you know, a great school and I had a lot of fun there. But I did apply to the University of Iowa's film school because, like, I'm not sure if that's the case now, but they had a Ph.D. in cinema back then. This is like, you know, 1994-ish. Um, um, which is which is an interesting thing. Did did they did they have that when you were there? Um, they had a film department. I can't remember whether they were. I mean, this was 1960, fall of 64 is when I was right. Um, I don't think I knew what a PhD was. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, I just thought, well, you're supposed to go to college. Um, and they had a terrific uh, theater department. Tennessee Williams wrote The Glass Menagerie there. They oh, have wow. a writer's workshop, which is probably the most famous place in the world if you want to study writing, whether you're talking about Kurt Vonnegut or Philip Roth or John Cheever or Richard Kim or Vance Borgeli or Gail Godwin wow. uh, or Marilyn Robinson. It goes on and on and on. And um, so it was a very exciting, it was a very exciting place to be. And I founded a playwriting scholarship there. Um, Oh, so, wow, man. That's so awesome. I, so I, I go back every couple of years because I really loved Iowa City. I just thought it was a, a, a fabulous place. Of course, the, the uh, regents are now trying to starve state universities into extinction. Mm. But I, I, don't, I don't know that they're going to succeed. But, you know, one of the big problems in this country, in my opinion, is that we don't pay. Um, what I was just saying, we don't pay teachers what they should be getting. Yeah. Anything yeah. Like what they should be getting. Yeah. You know, it's all about like, you know, what's the incentive structure and the incentive structure to become an educator <clears throat> is very low. You know, I think I actually love um, the the process of education. And oftentimes I get asked um, by sort of charter schools uh, that are developing programs for like underprivileged communities to come out there and teach my specialty. And like my specialty is game design virtual reality engineering and, and, and stuff like that. Um, and um, I love the process of it. It's actually a really fun process to teach, um, but it's not highly incentivized, right? It's actually very poorly incentivized. Um, well, it's ridiculous you know, because it's the most important job. Sure. And like the only incentive you get is the amazing engagement you get with these yeah, young minds. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and, and very well put. Because on both counts. One is that the rewards that are intangible of the, of the teaching learning experience and the relationship, and the other, which is any kind of monetary remuneration to enable you to live a halfway decent life while you're doing this job. And everybody, yeah. brother, is looking over your shoulder, and that doesn't count the guys wandering into classrooms with guns. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's that's horrible. So to to kind of shift over a little bit, because, you know, now I'm I'm kind of blown away. Um, you know, obviously, I've seen the kids stays in the picture. And, and you know, when when I was in college, um, you know, Robert Evans and his time at Paramount as like the Maverick producer or, or, or I'm sorry, the Maverick head of the studio who also served as the producer 
you know, with the Godfather and Love Story and Chinatown and this sort of amazing role, you were sort of in that mix as a young man, huh? Like uh, you were uh, like a part of that. You saw all of that happening around you. Well, I I had an office on the lot at Paramount for 15 years. They put me in the March Brothers building. I don't know what that tells you. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and that's where I worked on three Star Trek movies and a little bit on Fatal Attraction and some other stuff. Did you go away again? No, 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 no. I'm here. I'm here. Um, so, so did you? Did you ever have any uh, direct interactions with Mister with with Mister Evans? I'm just kind of a, you know, a fanboy. So it's like I've never really met anybody that's actually met him. Um, you, you know, was it was he as portrayed in all of the lore? You know, even recently with the actually, it's an it, it, it's an excellent um, a series on Paramount Plus called uh, The Offer. I don't know if you've seen that. Yes, um, I. What was that like? Is there any truth to that characterization? Because I I thought that was an incredible uh, portrayal of Bob Evans, you know, the good and the bad. A lot of it was accurate. A lot of it was inaccurate. And a lot of it was tidied up. <laughs> right. Can, can, can you give me a sample of each? No. No. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, did you ever have any conversations with him? Like, was there any kind of wisdom that he imparted to you that kind of stuck with you as a young man and kind of, you know, stayed with you in your career? The greatest wisdom that was imparted to me didn't come from Bob Evans. It came from a producer, an agent turned producer named Harry Offland, who is no longer with us. And Harry once said to me, Nick, avoid meetings. <laughs> right. Meetings. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Nothing bad happens if you don't go to the meeting, right? I, nothing gets done in meetings is my experience. So, so, um, so when you were working in the publicity department at Paramount, did you start to sort of get, you know, like opportunities to write scripts? Were you presenting scripts? How did you as a professional screenwriter sort of, come to be well i started well i i started writing screenplays at the university of iowa um i was i wrote a i took a jack finney novel i didn't have the rights to it or anything i just thought it was an exercise uh called assault on a queen and that and i had no idea how to write a screenplay but i just took page one and i thought well it should read like this as a movie and went on to page two and so forth and then a couple of years later when the movie of the book came out jack finney just to remind you also wrote uh time and again which they mm. keep making into a movie and invasion of the body snatchers all oh, right which, which they keep making into a movie uh there must be at least four different versions of it um but assault on a queen when it finally came out as a movie and I went to see it and it was, it was dreck. It was terrible. And it starred Frank Sinatra and Verna Lisi. And I thought, why did they change it from the book? Cause the book was like a movie ready to go. And, you know, I had a lot to learn about movie stars and what they want. Right. Uh, so, yeah. Anyway, that, so I was already writing screenplays and when i was working in new york in the publicity department at paramount um i was just rewriting press kits into new york times style english so civilians could read them as opposed to trying to make your way through variety um and then i learned there was going to be this movie that they were going to shoot in new york and boston and they didn't want to pay to bring a publicist in from the west coast and i said well why don't you let me be the publicist because i really wanted to watch a movie being made sure and that movie was love story oh wow um so i watched that movie being made and i think that's the first time i met bob evans because he was married to the star ali mcgraw and he flew in for thanksgiving in boston which was celebrated 
with the cast and crew at Jimmy's Harborside Restaurant. So I was, you know, I was a fly on the wall for all of this. That's awesome. Um, and then later, you know, wrote a book, the first thing I had published, first book I had published, which was a nonfiction book about the making of Love Story. And I got $3,000 advance for the paperback of this book. And I converted it into traveler's checks and headed west. Um, and when I got to L.A., uh, I got lucky. Somebody recommended a general to Napoleon and said, this guy's a really good general. And Napoleon mm -hmm. said, I know he's good, but <laughs> lucky. Right. But it's lucky. And I, I've been very, very lucky. So I was... I was in L.A. and I managed to get an agent and I started writing movies for television and I'd written two or three. And then the Writers Guild went on strike, as we do, and uh, we weren't allowed to write screenplays. All you were allowed to do was pick it. So we like walked up and down outside studios in the sunshine carrying placards. Um, and the woman with whom I was living at the time said, well, you're not allowed to write screenplays, but now you could write that Sherlock Holmes book that you always talk about. Mm -hmm. And she was right. I'd been thinking about this book for a very long time. There was no reason, uh, nobody I knew was interested in Sherlock Holmes, that's for sure, um, except me from reading it as a kid. And I had never gotten it out of my system. And I always wanted, to, well, I didn't always want, but I, I had this idea, I developed this idea over time. And it was not strictly speaking my idea because other people had compared Sherlock Holmes with Sigmund Freud, even hmm. Freud who enjoyed reading Sherlock Holmes stories, by the way, um, had on occasion compared himself to Sherlock Holmes. And so I, I found myself wondering how much Arthur Conan Doyle knew about the life and writing of Sigmund Freud. And I have learned, well, they're both doctors and they both died in the same city within nine years of each other. Uh, Freud, Sherlock Holmes was a cocaine addict. And so for a time was Sigmund Freud, was a co mm -hmm. cocaine user. And out of these different elements, during the Writers Guild strike, uh, I managed to write my novel, The 7% Solution. And much to my astonishment, since I'd never really accomplished anything uh, with my life, it became the number one best-selling novel in the United States for 40 weeks. And then it was made into a, a movie for which I wrote the screenplay. Mm. And the screenplay got nominated for an Oscar. And then I wrote a screenplay again from somebody else's idea called Time After Time. And I sold that on condition that I be allowed to direct it. Uh, and so sort of one thing led to. Yeah, another. yeah, that's that's awesome. And and, and what was that like? Do you, do you remember that moment where you got that letter in the mail that said the 7% solution was nominated for an Oscar? Like, like, was that a moment of happiness? Like, of, of oh, I was happy at that moment. Like, I remember quite clearly. <laughs> no idea. I mean, everything that happened with the book and the movie was utterly bewildering to me. I am not a a, a skier, but I was taken on a skiing trip, and I was halfway down a mountain in Colorado when the nominations were coming out. And I stopped for a hot chocolate at this place where they were, you know, selling hot chocolate. And I made a phone call and I learned on the side of the mountain that I, I had been nominated. And I, I was really happy, but there was no one to tell. Because I was like... <laughs> right. And, and um, yeah, no, that's really interesting. So what what's what's really fascinating to me is that you seem like you, you have this this highly kind of you know academic uh, or academic's the wrong word but this sort of um very literary background um 
you know, highly educated at one of the top schools in the country when it comes to really teaching the art form. And, you know, you get sort of transitioned into working in what people, <clears throat> you know, would, come, you know, like I think incorrectly referred to as like the sort of like the epitome of pop culture, which is like in the sci-fi realm. And it's not the sci-fi of of H.G. Wells or like, you know, War of the Worlds or 1984. It's this highly sort of optimistic, um, you know, sci-fi world of, of, of Star Trek. Um, and, you know, which is actually kind of fascinating to me because if you look at Star Trek One, you know, directed by Robert Wise, it's like, you know, it's like this weird artistic space opera movie where there's no dialogue for 15 minutes at a time sometimes. And it's very Stanley Kubrick 2001, super long shots and weird sound effects. And then it sort of transitions into Star Trek uh, II, The Wrath of Khan, which is actually a just like a good old fashioned American sort of action movie um, that that that's way more true to like the sort of you know, a wagon ride in the stars that Gene Roddenberry had always, you know, sort of, you know, described the franchise as like, how did you sort of make that transition or, or, or jump into that opportunity? Well, it's a, it's a long story. Um, when I was, uh, when Star Trek was first on television, I never watched it. All I saw was a guy with pointy ears and cheesy sets, and I didn't. <laughs> right. I, I think I missed whatever was remarkable about it. And there were things that were remarkable, but without a doubt, I was not a sharp enough knife in the drawer to see what they were. The international cast, the interracial cast, all that stuff it just blew right by me. I just never got past the sets and whatever. Um, I was introduced to Harv Bennett, who was in charge of producing the second Star Trek movie. He had produced the $6 million Man and Mod Squad and Rich Man, Poor Man. Um, and he had watched all 79 episodes and he and somebody had said that I would like him. And, and I did like him. And they showed me all this Star Trek stuff. And I thought, gosh, this reminds me of something that I really do like. And it took me a while knowing me to figure out what it was. And it was a, it was a series of novels that I read when I was about 13 or 14 about a captain in the Royal Navy called Captain Horatio Hornblower. Mm. And he, he, he was a captain in the Royal Navy during the Napoleonic Wars, and he had lots of adventures and a girl in every port. And this all sounded kind of cool to me. Um, and I thought, oh, this is Hornblower in outer space. Mm. Um, so I kind of glommed on to that and said, all right, so what we're dealing with here is battleships and submarines and so i wanted my movie to be a battleship submarine type navy story gene roddenberry was not happy with what i was doing for several reasons um gene roddenberry had or professed to have a view of human perfectibility that that human beings could could get better and i always said well where's the evidence for that um and so i have a much darker sensibility and when i was writing the screenplay of the wrath of khan and how i wound up doing that it was a sort of a strange thing there were five other scripts five different drafts and each one had a totally different story. They were just trying to get another Star Trek movie out of something. Mm. And I wound up cobbling together five different sort of plots into one screenplay. And in the process, I glommed on to Moby Dick. Mm. Khan as a kind of 
fallen angel. Uh, or there were also elements of paradise lost in all of this. And um, I don't have an academic background, but I have a, a, a literary background for sure. Yeah. What, I, what I like to do second best is read. I like to read. And I just read book after book after book. Yeah. And that's a talent. No, it's a passion. I don't know if mm. it's a, I just, that's what I do. Um, and so, and I'm a, I'm a Shakespeare fool. And, and Melville was also clearly a Shakespeare fool. It's interesting that he started out writing a sort of travel books for people, you know, before documentaries and movies and all kinds of stuff. People want to know what are the South Seas like and, and what are cannibals like? And he'd been a sailor. He'd done all that. And so he wrote books like Taipei and Umu that were sort of travel books. And he wrote a book about a big whale. And it was, it was sort of a fish story, I guess is what it was. And, and, and then right. he met uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne. He met him in Western Massachusetts. And Hawthorne said, <clears throat> you know, inside this draft, when, when Hawthorne met Melville, he said, inside your, this draft of what you're calling Moby Dick, which is presently, as, as I paraphrased it, a fish story. Yeah. There's another book trying to get out, a bigger book, mm. a book that deals with symbolic, even biblical ideas of what evil is yeah, and, and what virtue is and so forth. And he kind of blew Herman Melville's mind. I mean, you know, Herman Melville, as I recall, was a customs inspector in New York. Mm -hmm. um, so he went back and rewrote the book and it became Moby Dick. Wow. Um, and the book is dedicated to Nathaniel Hawthorne in wow. admiration for his genius. And I took that book and I transposed it in some form into Star Trek, in which sort of Kirk became Khan's Moby Dick. Yeah, yeah. It makes First of all, I never knew that. And it makes absolute perfect sense because that unreasonable obsession with, um, with revenge, um, if I'm understanding you correctly, that's the true evil that's being sort of discussed, right? It's like that inner, that inner obsession that clouds um, your intentions and makes you feel well, like other, you're the doing other, the righteous thing. The other, you know, there's a lot, there's an exchange between Ahab and Starbuck where Starbuck, his first mate, who, who now has a coffee chain named after him. Yeah. Uh, and that, Battlestar Galactica character is named after him. <laughs> but, oh, yeah, yeah. And Starbuck says to him, because uh, Ahab is crazy about this whale because the whale bit off his leg. Yeah. And Starbuck says to seek vengeance on a dumb beast that struck you out of blind instinct is blasphemous. Mm. And Ahab's comment is, talk not to me of blasphemy, man. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. Right. And he said, know ye, Starbuck, that all things in this world are but as pasteboard masks. Wow. It is the thing behind the mask I chiefly hate. Um, and all through the movie, uh, Khan does nothing but quote, Moby Dick, right? Quote Ahab. Wow, you know now that you say that, I'm getting chills, man. Because like these are two films that you know I watched so much as a child, um, and um, now that you say that um, in in Undiscovered Country, um, the the adversary character is constantly quoting Shakespeare, right? Like like there, there's a there's a connective tissue there between our two. Uh, you know, villains, for lack of a you know better word, with their kind of you know recalling of literature to sort of make their point. 
um, you know, very interesting. I had never connected those two things before. Um, you know, with like uh, when when like those beautiful moments where he keeps just doing like like the two fingers and quoting uh, you know Shakespeare um, and like you know attacking uh, you know uh, Kirk's ship. Well, first of all, that's awesome. I had never connected those two things before, um, but now it makes perfect, absolute sense, and this is why I love doing the show so much. Um, so, okay, so 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 basically, one of the things that's always confused me is that there is no actual, and this is probably like a stupid low-level comment, but there is nobody that gets credit for writing the screenplay of The Wrath of Khan. There's only like story by credits to Gene Roddenberry and like a few other gentlemen. But no, there is I, no I think there's a screenplay credit for a man named Jack Sowards. I, mm. I, think, I think he does get the, the, the credit for it. Um, originally, when I did my screenplay, uh, we put Harv Bennett's name on it, and then we learned, because Harv had never produced a feature, he was only television, that a producer couldn't have his name on as, as the writer. Oh, interesting. Uh, and so uh, then it be it became uh, Mr. Sowards, whom, whom I don't know, um, but who definitely wrote one of the five drafts. Right, uh, right. So the drafts, you know, was uh, Khan, that was one character, uh, Kirk meets his son. That was another story. The Genesis Project. That was another theme. The um, Lieutenant Savick. That was a character from one of the drafts. Um, uh, Spock died. That was another thing that was going on. And somehow I managed over a very short period of time. Uh, you you might get a kick out of my memoir, um, which yeah, is yeah um, yeah yeah I. I... I, I have it. I have not read through it, so I don't want to lie and say, you know, I, I'm familiar with it, but I haven't read it. Yeah, you're not. I appreciate you're not lying. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's, for those of your listeners uh, who want to find out details about the making of some of these movies, it's called The View from the Bridge, Memories of Star Trek and a Life in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a cool thing to place. to. Oh, oh absolutely. Um, and. and was there any kind of like after the movie comes out and look, I'm too young to remember the movie in the actual theaters. I, I, you know, look, I'm, I'm 46 now, so I am definitely up there in age, but the movie came out quite, quite a bit ago. Um, you know, uh, 1982, it came out. Um, and um, what there was an obvious distinction between the reception that Star Trek one got and the reception that the wrath of Khan got right. It, like, completely revitalized the entire you know franchise um was there a a sense of accomplishment that that kind of overwhelmed you a little bit was it a fun thing because you didn't come back and do another one until many many years later and you know you did another great one to me those are the two best ones um and you know was like how did you sort of take this kind of you know very mainstream success Oh, I took it very well. <laughs> <laughs> I think success is very agreeable. Yeah, um, yeah. I think I was lucky that when the 7% Solution became the number one book, I was already 28 years old. Mm. And that was old enough not to kid myself that I had written the great American novel, which I knew I had not. It was a fun adventure story that made people feel smart when they read it, the way the movies that I write tend to make people feel smart when they watch them. Um, and But I wasn't starting to believe my own press or when people start making a big fuss over you. I enjoyed every minute of it. I enjoyed being nominated for the Oscars. I don't really understand Oscars. I don't understand prizes for art. Sure. And if you want the best actor, or want to know who the best actor is, shouldn't they all be playing the same part? And then you could say, ah, this guy played it best. But otherwise, right. pairing apples and oranges. You want to see the same director? Let them all direct the same screenplay. Right, then, right, right. Right, right. Have have a baseline or have a 
like a sample or or, or a control as as so they say I, in science. So while I enjoyed and I I loved that I had made a good movie. I love that that people like the movie. I like that they still like it 40 years later. I'm happy, I'm relieved. I think movies are like souffles. They either rise or, or they don't. And and if there was such a thing as a formula, which everybody keeps frantically searching for, um, then every movie would be a hit. Sure. So, you, so there obviously isn't a formula and you, and you try things. And um, I, as I said before, I was lucky. I am lucky. And I've enjoyed every bit of that without confusing it, I think, I hope, for some kind of significance, larger stuff. Mm. Uh, you know, as uh, Gertrude Stein said, what's all this about being happy? Do the work. Right, right. And, it is about the work. And so you, you're on to the, the next thing. You know, Hal Prince, no matter how big a hit he had, the day after the thing opened to a smash reviews or whatever, he was in his office trying to figure out what's the next show. Yeah. What's yeah. The next show? Um, I've experienced that myself. I know exactly what you mean. You know, you, you know, one, one element um, that we've covered, I think heavily, and I'm, it's so much clearer now in my, in my mind is, you know, like, like we've said, your sort of literary background and, you know, the storytelling aspect of it and the story construction aspect of it. But, you know, one of the things that I enjoyed learning about the most when I was at NYU, because it was such a, a foreign thing to me, was the art of working with actors and directing actors to sort of uh, convey the emotions and the words that, you know, that are written to, you know, to, 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 you know, to achieve the goal that, that you have in mind for the story. How did you sort of, you know, um, sharpen that tool in your box when you were um, working with actors to get them to sort of give you what you wanted? Well, I started out in the theater. I right, started right. As an actor and then I became a director. And when I, when I teach directing, as I sometimes do at various universities, I always say to kids who want to be directors, I said, you have to take an acting class you, and you can't sit in the back and watch. Mm, that's very good advice. And make a fool of yourself like everybody else. And you have to learn how to talk to actors. I think a lot of times when directors these days are making films, they're technicians. They know about lenses. They know about CGI. They know about, uh, you know, online uh, editing and how to manipulate a drone. But they don't know how to talk to actors. And actors are frequently left to their own devices. When I was doing Star Trek II all those years ago, 40 years ago, it was Ricardo Montalban's first day on the set. And he was the only actor I hadn't gotten to rehearse with because he was doing his television show all the time. And I like to rehearse. I like to rehearse before you start not the six weeks that you do when you're putting on a play because that for, for movies, that's, that's too much. Mm -hmm. And the camera will, will, I think it bleeds all the spontaneity out of things, but enough so that the actors get to know the director, they get to know each other in the case of Star Trek. Of course, the actors knew each other quite well, but they always want to know about the director. One question, is he crazy? Mm. How crazy is he? Am I going to live? Do I have to pull the boat over the mountain? What's going to happen? So, you know, and these actors, again, the Star Trek cast, they were used to having a new director every week. So they were quite professional about that, very welcoming. But Ricardo, I had lunch with him once. I gave him a copy of Moby Dick and said, here, there it is. <laughs> right. And then I met him on his first day on the set when he was in full drag, and yes, that is his real chest. Um, and he has this long scene, six page scene that I wrote, where he reveals why he is so pissed off and enraged at Kirk. 
And so I blocked it out and showed him how I thought it should work. And he was a very courtly person. So you couldn't quite get through that veneer of manners and courtesy, um, and which is a kind of guardedness at the end of the day. Um, but he was letter perfect. He hit all the marks. My God, this is, was stunning, except that he yelled the whole thing at the top of his lungs. And I thought, fuck, you know, what happens if I try to talk to this guy? Is he going to punch me out? Or something? <laughs> right, right. This, this is only my <laughs> second movie I ever directed. And I had, by this time, directed a lot of plays and directed a lot of radio plays. So mm. it's not like I didn't know how to talk to them. So I said, well, let's go into your trailer. We'll have a little conversation. So he said, sure. And we sit there and I said, you know, Lawrence Olivier once said, you should never show an actor your top because once you show an actor your top, they know you got no place else to go. Right. And he sat back and he said, uh, oh, he said, you're going to direct me. He said, that's good. I need direction. I don't know what I'm doing up there. And then he started telling me all these stories about movie directors who said to him, you know, Ricardo, make it a good scene. That's not very helpful. Right. Ricardo, give it balls. You know, uh, 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 that, that's not helpful. You have to learn how to talk to these people. And, you know, I, I came to the camera late, but I came to actors comparatively early. Mm. And largely stood me in good stead. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's very cool. Um, yeah, yeah, that no, no, that makes a lot of um, you know sense. So, you know, you said something very interesting there. What 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 is the sort of distinction between helpful directing? Uh, like, what makes something a helpful directing gesture to an actor? Is it to be very specific about the scene? Is it to be specific about the delivery? What do you think are sort of the, the hallmarks of useful directing? How you talk to an actor depends on the personality and character of the actor that you're talking to. And you have to adjust. You have to know what actor, what, what method is going to work best with mm. actor. There's no one size fits all here sure um so with ricardo i i seldom had to finish a sentence i could just start it and he would pick it up when i was doing time after time i remember at the sort of penultimate scene of the movie when the ripper and hg wells are having their face off in the museum and david warner who just died within the past month mm. a lovely wonderful actor who whom i used twice because he's also in star trek six but he plays jack the ripper and he was sort of confused on the set he goes i don't know what i'm doing here I i'm i'm lost at how to play this and i said you're very tired and he said stop don't say anymore i got it and so he played the Ripper as exhausted by that point in the, and that was all he needed. Um, there is a wonderful book. It's a new book. Mm. I don't know if you're, if you read, but I'm telling your listeners and it's by a man named Isaac Butler, B U T L E R. And it's called the method, how the 20th century learned to act. Mm. And it is a comprehensive history of, of what Stanislavski and the Moscow Art Theater began in 19th century czarist Russia and how it came to America and how it not only permeated something called the Actors Studio mm -hmm. and Martin Brando and James Dean and all that, but how it also influenced American culture, or as you like to say, pop culture since it's the only kind of culture we ever 
time we ever want to use the word culture, we're so terrified of it. We have to sure up in front of it to make yeah. it popular, right? Like easy to digest. Yeah. Um, you know, what's his name? Uh, Goebbels used to say, whenever I hear the word culture, I reach for the safety catch on my pistol. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, it's called the method how the 20th century learned to act. But as I'm trying to suggest, it's about lot, a lot more than acting. It's about how the method, as it's called, sort of permeated popular culture mm. uh, and, and the way we live, the way we think, and the way we behave. Sure, yeah, that's very interesting uh, thesis. I like that. Ricardo, as I say, you would make a suggestion and he would take it and run with it. With Bill Shatner, um, he knew the character of Kirk pretty well. The main thing was to uh, get him to not play Kirk defensively as somebody who was sort of striking attitudes on the hero and, and get him to just be, to act normally with, or, or I shouldn't say act, I should say to behave, mm. to behave as opposed to acting. And I found that the more times you would do a scene with him, the better he would get. And I finally put together in my pea brain that he was getting bored. Mm. And when he got bored, he stopped sort of um, posing for it. And he just was. Um, so it's not like I had to start a sentence that he would finish or anything like that. I just had to let him, in a way, relax into it. Relax. Um, and because he was a very, he probably still is, a very fine actor. And yeah. Montalban was off the charts. I said to him, uh, after I watched him finish that scene, I said, you really should be playing king lear right and he he made some disparaging comment about his hispanic accent sure and i said nobody will give a shit right you articulate perfectly no one's gonna care but the closest he ever got to lear was playing Khan. yeah yeah um and, and then the Undiscovered Country is, you know, is such a is such a, you know, good movie. It happens four movies later after Wrath of Khan, and it's such an incredible sort of finale curtain call to the kind of original series cast and and that whole sort of era. How how did you sort of get talked back um, into that saddle? When the Wrath of Khan was done and you know, had the biggest opening in movie history or whatever it was. Um, they asked me if I wanted to do three. And I said, what's that about? And they said, um, it's about, you know, Spock sort of comes back. I said, like, you know, comes back to life. Right. <laughs> I said, are we talking resurrection because i don't know how to do resurrection sure so i bowed out of that there was a whole big kerfuffle it's in the book you know, that the, the whole idea of leaving it open-ended that spock could somehow come back was something that i was not at all persuaded at the time mm. was a good idea i didn't think it was a good idea i thought it was sort of unforgivable right. um I thought you wrench people who care about this man so much. And then you say, oh, just kidding, folks. It was all kind of a dry. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, I've mellowed, you know, since yeah. then. Con consequences are a real part of life, you know, and, and, and they need to be um, internalized and accepted. So maybe, maybe I was mistaken. Anyway, I didn't do three. Then when they did four, um, I was doing other things and I got a call from the studio, come here right away. We need some help. And these were my friends. So I trotted over 
And I said, what's going on? And they said, well, we have a script and we're due to start shooting in, I don't know, six weeks or whatever it was. And we don't like the script, but we like the story and we want to start over. I said, well, what's the story? And I was just, was told, go see Harvin Leonard and they'll tell you. So I went over to see Harvin Leonard and um, I was sort of surprised at you know, what I was hearing, but I thought, oh, this is really cool. I said, do you want me to read the other script? And they said, no, no, don't read the other script. Um, just do this story. So this is the one, as we all know, that was about the whales. It's great. And it was, it was, I love Star Trek four. I thought it was really cool. Well, I got, I got to be, you know, and I, I think of myself as being hilarious. So I thought, okay. <laughs> right. I, right. The right. Double dumbass on you. Or, or, or Yeah, you bet. <laughs> and, um, and it, 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 it was a funnily enough, it was a time travel story that was also set in San Francisco, like time after time. And I said, can't we do it in another town? Does it have to be San Francisco? I already did this. Right, right. You know, how, why can't they go to Paris? Um, and I was told something about the whales wouldn't fit in the sin. So, you know, I didn't get to do that. But anyway, that was how I became involved with four. And I wrote all the parts on Earth, and Harv Bennett wrote the bookends mm. in space. My first line in the movie was, when are we? Mm. And, and Spock says, judging by the pollution content in the atmosphere, I'd say we reached the late 20th century. Um, and then I, I go out after the line about D.H. Lawrence and the whales and stuff like that. Um, then I was off in, I think I was in India shooting the deceivers with Pierce Brosnan for Merchant Ivory when they were doing Star Trek V. I think, mm. I, I can't remember now, but um, I, I, um, so I, I had nothing to do with Star Trek V. Mm. Then after that, I was living in London and I got taken to lunch by Frank Mancuso and I think Martin Davis at Claridge's. And they said, you know, we don't want to end with the original cast on five. We want to try to do something. Yeah. More or less. One last more hurrah. Squeeze of the lemon. Um, and do you have any ideas? And I said, no, because I never have ideas. And uh, they said, but, you know, would you be interested? I said, sure. And then Leonard came to uh, visit me. And we had a walk. And he said, you know, the Klingons have always been our standard stand-ins for the Russians. I said, oh, I don't think I knew that. And he said, <laughs> you know, and Star Trek will always reflects current events. As, as, by the way, all art is always ineluctably product of the time in which it's created. Sure. And the wall has come down in Berlin and the Soviet Union was collapsing. And he says, what if the wall comes down in outer space? Who am I if I have no enemy to define me? Right. And I said, stop. I yeah, got yeah, yeah. It. Well, I just had a flash of that scene when he's in his... Uh, in his quarters and he says pretty much exactly what you just said. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So that, that became the, pardon the pun, the genesis of what became the undiscovered country. The undiscovered country is obviously a, a reference to Hamlet's uh, soliloquy and was the original title of Star Trek two. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, I didn't, well, wow, that, that's, you know, people have to go pick up your book because that's an incredible little detail I never even knew. That's, well, that's if, awesome. If you know the to be or not to be soliloquy, you know that Hamlet refers to death as the undiscovered country. Sure. Who's born no traveler return. So because it was about the death of Spock, I thought we called the undiscovered country. And then that title got taken away from the, and it was originally the vengeance of Khan. And I said, 
George Lucas never going to let you use the vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Called the Revenge of the Jedi. And you're right. with George Lucas over Indiana Jones. Right. Oh, God, I lost you again. All right. I, yeah. Can you still hear me? Or yes, yes. I... Yeah, I got you back. I got you back. Anyway, so when it came time to do Star Trek VI, I said, this time I'm going to get my, my, my title that I want. I don't care whether it fits or not. I don't right. think titles matter. Um, the wrong title can matter. The sure. you know, uh, uh, I did two Philip Roth novels. I did The Human Stain, and I did a novella of his called The Dying Animal. And on The Human Stain, I said, you know, you think this is going to pass the Saturday night test? Right. <laughs> You Let's want to see the human stain. <laughs> you want, you want to take in the human stain? <laughs> right. I, and I begged them to let me change the, the, the title of the movie. I wanted to call it American Skin, mm. which is, after all, what the movie was about. And they said no, because they were afraid of losing Philip Roth readers. You know, <laughs> okay. And then, but then when I did The Dying Animal, I said, no, I am not using this title. And the movie's called Elegy, and it's it's a much better title and it's a much better movie. So, so you, so you, you have this, this, um, this kernel for the undiscovered country. Um, you write this beautiful screenplay and you cast uh, Christopher Plummer as the, you know, as that. Chang. Know. I'm sorry. General Chang. Yeah. Yeah. But, but also as this guy who's, who's like a mirror image of Kirk as he also doesn't want to let go of uh, the sort of cling on way, right? Like he's, he's also holding on to the, the animosity and doesn't want to admit that the wall is indeed down and is looking for any excuse um, to maintain the relationship as it was. Um, and the performance by Christopher Plummer as Chang is just, it's just, it's just absolutely incredible. You know, it, it, uh, you know, look, one of the things I would I would say about your very shrewd observation about these enemies who don't want to let go, yeah, is that we filmed the coup d'état where Chancellor Gorkhan, which was as close as we could come to Gorbachev, <laughs> right, uh, right. rest in peace. We we were in the cutting room when the coup d'etat in the Soviet Union occurred, we shot it before it happened. Wow. And, you know, I'm, I'm almost ashamed to say that at the time, we nobody was wondering whether poor Mr. Gorbachev was alive or dead because he had disappeared and nobody knew. We just thought, is this good or bad for the movie? And the movie ends with Kirk sort of pontificating and saying, people can be very frightened of change. And everybody thought when the wall came down and the Soviet Union collapsed, that we were all going on to a brave new, better world. And that people who fought against that happening were somehow sort of scaredy cats. And that Harvard conservative uh, philosopher, I guess, Francis Fukuyama, asked if we'd reached the end of history. And the movie, when you watch it again, is a bit smug in that department because as we've shown or we've learned, we didn't come to the end of history. Mm. Things got worse. Things are much worse. We're now hanging by a thread. Planet Earth is hanging by a thread, a nuclear thread, an environmental thread. Things are the worst now they've ever been. And so that maybe in hindsight, eyeball to eyeball between two superpowers with their fingers on nuclear buttons where they had enough nuclear weapons on each side to kill every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth 54 times over sure. was somehow better, somehow better than crazy people running around with atom bombs in suitcases. Right. Where we're headed. 
And so, um, yes, in retrospect, the movie kind of, it was a product of its time. We all thought we'd reached the end of history. We all thought, yep, it's all going to be a brave new world from here on out. And nobody, you know, was able to accurately prognosticate, foretell, foresee what was coming next, which, you know, human beings always find new ways to fuck it up. That's our gift. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so first of all, this has been fascinating. I, we, we've run way over, but I have two more just kind of fun questions about this movie because it's, 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 um, you know, it's something that's, you know, that has stuck with me since the first moment I saw it. So number one, um, when, when you made this film was at the peak of a young actor's career in Hollywood, his name was Christian Slater and you had him in one scene where he just shows up and um, tells, you know, um, Sulu, like, you know, like I believe he tells Sulu that there's something wrong and, and asks Sulu to come to the bridge. Um, you know, there's been so many kind of, um, legends about how Christian Slater ended up in the movie. Cause at the time, I, I mean, I'm sure you remember, he was literally one of, you know, Hollywood's biggest actors, you know, he was as big as they get, you know, back then, um, you know, he was on the trajectory in, in that sort of triple a status. Um, what, what's the reality of how Christian Slater did that tiny little cameo and how did you feel about that? His mother was the casting director on the movie. Oh, okay. <laughs> and Chris Slater was a big Star Trek fan. Cool, cool. It, was it fun to work with him just for like a few minutes? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, because like back then we were like, you know, Chris Slater, I believe he had, he was about to do True Romance, but he already had a Heathers and he already had all these big movies. And as kids seeing him up there, we were like, wow, Star Trek is is the best, you know, Star Trek is the epitome of like speaking to our generation. You know, they brought, you know, they brought our golden boy in there. Um, and it was such a cool moment. Even that whole sequence with Sulu and Sulu now being the captain and, and, you know, um, you know, ramming speed and terror apart if we have to, and, and how you kind of gave Sulu this amazing uh, end to his arc as a character you know, where he became like this very powerful commander um, was also really, really friggin' cool. Um, God, that movie is just great. You know, The Undiscovered Country, um, you know, it just fascinates me. The other thing I love about it was you mentioned George Lucas and um, the special effects that ILM brought to the table on an Undiscovered Country were absolutely top notch at the time. Was was that was that a fun time, sort of working with the ILM folks and in, in getting that whole thing put together? Yes, it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, as I said to you earlier, I've always wanted the spaceships to be like submarines. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted the sets. I didn't want them to look like they. You know, when I watched the first movie, I thought it looks like they're in a Holiday Inn. Right. <laughs> you know, I thought. And the and the enterprise didn't make a noise, and I thought it has to make a noise. Sure. Bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, ba -dum, bum. And I and 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 battleships and submarines are not built for comfort. Right. Uh, and you know this put me at odds with Gene Roddenberry, who said it's 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 not a military organization. It's like the Coast Guard. I said even the Coast Guard ain't built for comfort. Sure. Uh, so Any way you want to slice it. So. Um, then I, you know, was writing this scene. And by the way, I want to stress, I co-wrote the screenplay. I did not write it by myself. It was a story by, you know, that I concocted with Leonard Nimoy. And my co-writer was Denny Martin Flynn, no longer alive, but a wonderful writer. So I don't want to leave him out of this. Sure, uh, sure. But this one sequence I'm proud of because I, I think I, it was my, my own, was I thought, how do you assassinate somebody in outer space. What's what's a cool way yeah, to Yeah, such a great scene. And I thought, you know, it's interesting that when I look at movies of the space station, everybody's floating. Yeah. I look at Star Wars or Star Trek or any space movie, they're always walking like it's like they're in a hotel. 
And I thought, so we can infer the existence of a machine on these ships that simulates or creates gravity. Okay, if that's the case, how come in all those ray gun battles, nothing ever hits the gravity machine? And wouldn't it be cool if it did? And everybody started floating and two guys in magnetic boots show up. Yeah. And, and, and bl blow away Gorkon. And then we would have floating blood. Pink uh, the, blood. Ooh, ooh. The color was going to come later, but the idea that it was going to be floating blood. And I thought, great. And I'm sitting in my at my computer in London and there's a tap on my shoulder and it turns out to be me, but the director saying, how are you going to do that? And I remember at the time saying, it's movies, we'll figure it out. Mm. And that was, you know, that was just at the beginning of CGI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. CGI made it easy. It, it makes everything easy, which, by the way, I think is the downfall of movies. Everything gets so easy. Sure. The audience doesn't have to imagine anything anymore. And it's my theory that the greatest artistic media all depend for their success on something that they leave out. Paintings do not move. Music has no intellectual content. Words are just code on a page. In each case, it is the imaginative contribution made by the viewer, the listener, the reader, whatever, that makes the thing happen, that completes it. The painting moves when it meets your eye. Beethoven becomes profound when it hits your ear. It's mm. otherwise just a series of unrelated sounds. Um, the words make you laugh or cry when your brain decodes them. Movies alone have the hideous capacity to do everything for you. And so as a director, you try to figure out, what can I leave out? That's why radio is such a great artistic medium because it brings your imagination in. And imagination, by the way, needs no training. Right. You hear one housewife say to the other, Madge, look at that ring around the collar. And we're there. We, we, we visualize it. Our imagination is into play. But anyway, uh, that's sort of my, well, part of my philosophy. Yeah. La last thing on Undiscovered Country, because it's such a, a cool... First of all, there's this great, you know, you mentioned Arthur Conan Doyle before. There's this great kind of detective story that happens post, you know, the murder um, or the assassination. Um, once uh, Kirk um, is in Urapente at, at the prison. But at the time, you also, you know, which I think is one of the beautiful things about Undiscovered Country is that it brings in these kind of mainstream sort of cultural icons and integrates them into the world so seamlessly. And, and one of those was, you know, Iman, who at the time was also like, you know, becoming a very popular figure. And the Iman character, the the sort of shapeshifter, um, was such a was such an interesting little, you know, touch. Was that was that something that you guys kind of all sort of brainstormed, like, you know, the shapeshifter Iman character, because it, it, it's a it's a character in Star Trek lore that I, I think it's forgotten about a little bit, but it's, it's just such an absolutely cool touch. Well, I can't honestly say that I remember how we came up with this. Um, as I say, Denny and I wrote the script together somewhere along the line. I think we called her a cameloid. Um, <laughs> And yeah, it makes sense. It was a lot of fun working with her because she was so drop dead gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. She was like, I mean, back then she was a supermodel married to like a super big celebrity. I mean, she was. Yeah, but she, she was, was. She's a great. She's a. She was a great, fun person, and a great actor. I mean, she delivers a great role in that. You know, yeah, like in the very good as Martia. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, such a great movie. And like, last question because I know I'm, I've been abusive with your time. You've been so generous, and I thank you so much for your time and and for chatting with me. Um, was there ever any chat talk about you coming back into the Star Trek universe? With I mean, with two of the biggest, you know, accolades I think in the entire universe, 
you would figure, hey, maybe we bring him back to try to, you know, do the third one. Has there ever been any chat about that? Sure. Right. That's as far as it goes. Well, I mean, I worked on the first year of Star Trek Discovery. Oh, okay, okay. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. With um, uh, this is with the original showrunner. I forget his name right now. Um, who Brian was there? Fuller. Brian Fuller. Yeah, very extremely talented. Uh, Hannibal is one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Um, he's just such an incredible talent. Was it with the Brian Fuller uh, team, like pre? That was I was there for the first year of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Did you direct some episodes of, of I did, the first? I did not. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Cool. Um, all right. Look, you know, I I've actually I'm quite friendly with you know a lot of the folks over there, so I know there was a little bit of drama back then. So I won't even get into that stuff um, because it was such a you know there's such beautiful you know work. Um, um, but yeah, this has been Nicholas Meyer. I, I'm I'm in such you know again. Thank you so much. Uh, the book is a, a, a View from the Bridge. I'll put the oh, links. No. Hey, sorry. A View from the Bridge is a play by Arthur Miller. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. My, my, my memoir is called The, T-H-E, View from the Bridge. Okay, Memories The View from the Bridge. Okay. And a life in Hollywood. Thank you. Yes. If you could send, uh, um, you know, I will put the link down below. I'll get all the link and all the information. Nicholas, thank you so much. Is there anything that you know else that you're working on these days that 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 you'd like to share with us? Well, I'm writing another Sherlock Holmes novel, which is called Sherlock Holmes and the Telegram from Hell. Oh wow! Um, and um, I'm working on a television series uh, about Sigmund Freud. Oh wow! And. Uh, working on another television series called jet set and a lot of that's, work a lot that's of awesome work. that's awesome man so look maybe one day we can chat again nicholas this has been truly amazing man there's so much uh that that you've given me to think about um and um i'm actually gonna go read um uh, the seven percent solution not like i'm very intrigued by that i'm gonna read the book before i watch the movie i've never seen the movie and uh, I'm i'm actually very very intrigued by that of a what a 28-year-old uh, Nicholas Meyer put to the page. You'll have to tell me what you think. I always like to know what people think. Okay, awesome. Nicholas, once again, thank you so much. Sorry we had a couple little tech difficulties. I'm sure uh, it's my fault. I don't yeah. know what's on over here. All right, awesome. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you for listening. I'll put all the links down below. And have a good one. And until next time.